Hi everyone, welcome to Pi Data, our April gathering. Um, I'm Patricia Schuster, I'm a postdoc at the University of Michigan, one of the co-organizers, together with Sean Law and Ben Zylan, who are over there. Um, I want to start by thanking our sponsors. We have NumFocus, who sponsors the meetup group itself. TD Ameritrade provides this space for us to gather, and Midas has purchased our dinner. So, if you know people from these organizations and you see them, please say thank you for sponsoring our group. A few quick announcements. Uh, we have an emergency exit here in case we need to use it. And sure. is there one back there as well? Uh, just right uh, to the right of the entrance. Okay. The came in, uh, okay. Don't use uh, elevators. No elevators. Thanks. Okay. Um, feedback. We're always looking for feedback on the group, on the quality of your experience. There's a number of different ways you can contact us. You can tell us directly, or you can contact us on Twitter or Gmail with these uh, names here. Uh, and we're in a borrowed space, so please clean up after yourself. No one's claiming at this point. Okay, Q&A. Uh, we'll have time for Q&A at the end, so unless your questions are quick, just hold your questions till the end. And please phrase your question in the form of the question. Keep the conversation moving. Try to keep your questions short, under 30 seconds. And avoid long statements or monologues. So you can always approach the speaker or another participant afterward uh, if you want to have a longer conversation. Now I'll read our code of conduct. Pi data is dedicated to providing a harassment-free meeting experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression disability, physical appearance, body size, race, or religion. We do not tolerate harassment of meeting participants in any form. All communication should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any of our meetup events. Be kind to others, do not insult or put down other attendees. Behave professionally. Remember that harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate for PI data. Attendees violating these rules may be asked to leave the meetup at the sole discretion of the meetup organizers. Thank you for helping make this a welcoming, friendly event for all. Um, so of course we have a very diverse audience in terms of like background. So additionally, uh, if someone doesn't understand a concept, you can explain it to them and there's just no assumption that, that people should know everything that's presented to them. So we're all open with our ideas here. Uh, so we're gonna do a quick icebreaker. You can meet the people around you. So today's question, uh, since we have a speaker coming from Philly, what is your favorite city in the U.S. that you visited, and why? So just introduce yourself to the people near you. <laughs> What's your favorite city, Julia? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I like Boulder a lot. Oh, nice. It's a very pleasant place. Cool. Yeah. Not really a city, maybe, but good place. Yeah. That's cool. I've never been there. My husband, my husband is a blonde guy on the end, Charlie. Okay. His best friend lives in Boulder. We're gonna visit him this summer. Oh. So I'm finally gonna go there. Yeah. yeah. To the yeah. best city. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite city is Pittsburgh. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I've never been there. You never been to Pittsburgh? No, it's like very strangely far from yeah, Philly. Yeah, like six or seven hours away. Yeah. Right? So I just learned recently that it's not Harrisburg. Like I like conflated them. Okay. And I've been to Harrisburg, which is has a good farm show. Okay. Farms. Yeah. yeah. They have farms. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. What's good about Pittsburgh? Um, it's a very small city, mm -hmm. and you can walk like the whole distance of the city. And so, like a lot of people, they have a, people there have a ton of sports pride, even though their teams are like not. not kind of like trash. Great. And people just walk all the way, like 45 minutes across the city to go to the games. And uh, I don't know. It's just like this magical place where yeah. people are pretty nice to each other. Yeah. Also, I find it very charming and interesting that people like get tattoos of Pittsburgh athletic teams on them. Like people from Pittsburgh will generally have a tattoo of like the Steelers or the Penguins or something it's like, like that. It's like a penguin. It's yeah. like not a Linux thing. It's pride. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. It's right. a good icebreaker. <laughs> Everyone's really taken to it. The last one that we did was like um, after Christmas. It was like tell us a statistic that someone told you over break that like you really questioned and think is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can I hear a few favorite cities? Just a few quick hands, or just call it out. L.A. L.A. New York. New York. Santa Fe. Santa Fe. Right. Come on, man. <laughs> Barcelona. 
Where's that? Michigan. Okay. Oh. Okay. Cool. And what was this one? I was going to say Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor. Okay. Yes. And our speaker's favorite city is Boulder, Colorado. Oh. Um, so this month in data science, uh, so Sean told me about this interesting blog post that comes from Capital One, and they are doing hyperparameter optimization at scale. So trying to accomplish this for companies with large amounts of data, and a lot of people are using this data. And in fact, this is relevant to our speaker in June, whose company is working on similar solutions. And our next speaker for May is Kaylin Houdon, who is working on building data science, and that'll be May 13th. It's on a Monday. So usually we're doing it on Wednesdays, but this one's a special one. It's on a Monday. Okay. Also, there's a conference coming up in Ann Arbor called Not Another Big Data Conference on May 10th and 11th. Sean is speaking. Um, so maybe consider attending and supporting him and clapping for him. Okay, now we like to take a minute to do some community announcements. So for instance, if you have an event that you're planning that you want to share with everyone, or if you're looking for to hire someone or you're looking for a job, feel free to stand up and announce that you're looking for a job. Yes, Keen. Uh, Excellent. Okay, so if you're interested in uh, talking to Keen about this, please, you know, connect with him after the presentation. Any other things, Logan? Yeah. So my name is Logan. I work on our data science engineering team here at TD Ameritrade. We are hiring for an AI data science developer. Uh, Charlie here in the front row is also on our team. I'm, we just posted the position today, and it'll hopefully be up by tomorrow at careers.tdameritrade.com. But I'm gonna leave these with Charlie, so if you're interested, you can see him afterwards. He's easy to find. He's like six, seven, and we're in a purple shirt. <laughs> 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 yeah, so this is more of a junior to mid-level, so. Um, definitely Python, if you know Java as well, it'd also be preferable, but... Oh, we're putting all full-time positions? Yes, yes. So. Excellent. Any, any others? Okay. Well, thank you for sharing those. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Julia Signal is a software developer at Anaconda, Inc., we're currently working on developing best practices for Python using Earth scientists. Earth scientists who use Python. I uh, messed up the tone on that. <laughs> she works on visualization tools within the PyViz ecosystem and data ingestion and analysis tools in the broader Pi data world. She lives in Philadelphia and previously did hydrology research at Princeton, studying lightning and rain patterns, water movement through the landscape, and stream flow. Wow, very cool work. So let's welcome our speaker, Julia. Um, I have posted all my material to this GitHub repo. You should be able to find it. Um, it's just my name and then Pi Data Ann Arbor 2019. Um, so if you want to check that out, uh, everything I'm going to be showing here it will also be there. Um, so I'm going to be running through mostly, all of this is going to be live demo, so uh, hopefully it works. Um, and if you can't see every bit of it, feel free to go to the repo, check it out. Um, I'm going to be talking about using um, Pi Data and PyViz to analyze earth science data. So earth science data has this unique, or not unique, but um, this challenge of having multi-dimensional data sets. Uh, we always have lat lawn, and we often have time, and then we have whatever we actually care about. Um, so these are all stored in idiosyncratic file formats. There's netcdf files, there's uh, czar, there's all sorts of different file formats. Um, and so there's this, so what I'm gonna be talking about is the workflow for Earth scientists um, using PyData and PyViz. Um, PyData and, and PyViz are kind of these opinionated sets of tools that we use, that we recommend using. Um, and uh, so they, it starts with a data ingestion. So in this case, um, I'm gonna be talking about using intake to get from the file format itself into a data set that you can work with in Python. And then you can work on that data set using X-Array, um, which uses Dask behind the scenes to do parallel computing. Um, and then you can iterate um, doing analysis using Dask and X-Array to analyze your data. 
once you have your data set up in a way that's ready for visualization, you can then use HVPlot, which um, uses data shader and bokeh um, to generate figures. And then you can go to more of an interactive dashboard um, using panel. So this is uh, just the overview of what I'm going to be talking about. But um, all of these tools, you can find them on pyviz.org, um, or also they're just standard um, PyData tools. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a specific case study, which is um, this heat and street trees case study. So this is um, Philadelphia, um, zoomed in in this case. Um, but we're going to be making this dashboard that allows you to, um, uh, to set the threshold for the surface temperature that you're looking at and to um, look at where the trees are placed and explore how the surface temperature um, interacts with the, or the relationship between the surface temperature and the density of street trees. Um, so this work was originally done by um, Ken Steve, uh, at, uh, who's at the master, who founded the Master of Urban Spatial Analytics at Penn. Um, he did it all in GIS. Uh, I saw a talk of his, and then I decided to recreate it using our tools. Um, and then I extended it to have interactivity. So that's the basis of this. You can read about his work um, at this blog. Um, but yeah, all of it was done in Esri tools. Uh, so I just thought it'd be interesting to see uh, how much of that we could recreate in open source tools. Um, so I binderized this. So you should be able to just click on this and get to binder uh, and run that interactively without doing any downloads. Um, I don't know if people have heard of Binder before, but it's just an open source, or it's an open place where you can host uh, different environments and content. It might take a while to load because there's a lot of dependencies. You can also run it locally. All right, so let's get into it. So uh, I haven't run any of this. I just restarted it, so um, it should just go. Um, so first we're going to do a bunch of imports. Um, this notebook is going to be requiring um, a special package that's put out by Rastereo, um, which is a top of, for top of atmosphere calculations. So we're going to be using Landsat data to calculate the surface temperature of the Earth. Um, and then we'll be looking at that in more detail. So here's some info about Landsat data. Um, it's basically a satellite that takes uh, images at a bunch of different frequencies and um, these are the descriptions of the different frequencies and you can use these different bands to calculate different products. So we're going to be using the red, the near infrared and then the thermal infrared layers. So those are the ones we're interested in today but all the bands can be used for different things. All those data are available um, on Google Cloud Storage and on S3. So I've written an intake catalog. Intake is a a uh, package that we have been working on really actively at Anaconda. It's fully open source, um, but it's for ingestion. So it's a way of specifying in a YAML specification um, exactly how your data are meant to be loaded into Python. So this is a thing that's been thought about for a long time, but the idea is that um, instead of having the top section of every piece of code that you write be a bunch of um, read CSV, read blah, blah, blah. This is the separation. Um, you can just extract that into a YAML file, and then you never have to think about it again. <laughs> That's the goal. Um, and you can also distribute that alongside your data, and then no one has to think about it. Um, so I've written uh, that for the Google, um, the Google Cloud Storage Landsat bands. And that's described here. Um, so we're only looking at specific bands. Um, I won't go into this in too much detail, but if people are interested, we can talk about it more later. Um, but basically, we choose the path in the row and then the product ID. Those things you have to figure out. Um, but then you will be able to go and get that exact band. So that defines the area that's generally above Philadelphia. Um, I went and like looked for what those numbers were in this case. Um, but, that, but you should be able to go and take a different path and band if you're interested in a different area. Um, I'm going to open a DAS client just so we have it for later in case we want to look at it. Um, this will show us what DAS is up to in the background, um, but we won't bother with it right now. 
So now we're going to load the data from that intake catalog and store it in a Dask, in a Dask um, X ray object. So this is using X ray, which is kind of analogous to pandas, but for n dimensional data. It's a really great library if you want to check it out. Um, it's not developed by Anaconda. Um, and it, behind the scenes, it's using Dask. So you can see here it says Dask array. So that means that our data is not actually loaded in yet. We've just read the metadata. So that, you, that didn't take very much time at all, right? So, and I don't have the data cached locally. So um, the data is not there yet. But we do know all this information about it. And one thing we know about it is the coordinate reference system. Since this is geographic data, it's projected. And we need to know more about what that projection is. So we'll grab that off. We'll store it as a Cartify object. And then we're going to try and figure out what area is over Philadelphia so that we only look at the area that we're interested in. Because right now, our data set is um, like 7,000 by 7,000 by 4. So it's a, lot, it's a fair amount of data. We don't want to have to be dealing with all that if we don't have to. So I'm going to get this neighborhood data from Open Data Philly. Um, this, is a GeoJSON this is a GeoJSON file. So we read it in using GeoPandas. And now we have these different geometries that we can use to get the area of Philadelphia. So I'm going to get the bounds of those geometries. Um, so this is, yeah, that's just the bounds of the different geometries. And then we can get the lower corner, the upper right corner, and we can pull out um, the lat lawn of the area that we're interested in. We'll use that to, we'll convert that into uh, the coordinate reference system that we're interested in. And then we'll use that to subset our data into the area that we actually care about. So now we have our subset. Um, we're going to persist it so that we have it in memory so that everything will be faster from now on. So we have this. Uh, now you'll see that our data set's a lot smaller. It's 1,000 by 1,000. Um, so that'll be a lot quicker to do all the rest of our computations. So now we can create, uh, now that we have that sorted, we have our area that we're interested in. We can take a look at it, make sure that it looks right. Um, so to do that, I'll just do a quick uh, this is going to use a lot of different tools really quick. But um, basically, if you're comfortable using the pandas.plot API, which I'm, does anyone use that? Do you use pandas.plot? OK, some people. Um, this is a similar API. It's based on them. Um, it uses a bunch of arguments. So it's kind of data first approach. So you use your data, and then you call that hvplot, which is analogous to dot .plot. Um, and then you set some different variables on some different arguments on that. So in this case, we're going to um, use data shader to uh, condense all our data, aggregate it to the pixel, and then we'll plot that rather than plotting all of our data all at once. And then we're going to set the coordinates reference system so that it's actually georeferenced. Um, we're going to set the color map and the height and the width. And then we're going to make a neighborhood plot using the um, GeoJSON that we've loaded. And we're going to make that geo. And then we're going to also um, color it by this ar attribute called map name. So let's make that. This will take a minute because it's um, grabbing all that data and rendering it. So this is, um, that's Philly. Uh, that's the shape of Philly, if people are interested in that. Um, but you see that we have all this. Um, this is the neighborhoods that we've rendered. And then underneath it, <laughs> that's, a bad, that's a bad hover text. Um, but we have all the different, uh, this is the Landsat imagery um, that I've just rendered in gray here because the color is not very meaningful um, for just one band. So you can zoom in. As you zoom in, it gets more, um, oof, got messed up there. But as you zoom in, it gets more, um, more uh, resolute. OK, so we've, we've got the right area. Now we can calculate the NDVI, the um, vegetative index. Um, so this is really easy to calculate. We just take the um, near infrared and the infrared band, the near infrared and the red bands, uh, and do this calculation, and we can get the NDVI. This is just the first step for calculating surface temperature. So we just need that. We can plot it um, just to make sure that it looks normal. So you'll see that the water has really high NDVI, and then more urban areas have lower NDVI. Um, and then we'll use 
the thermal infrared bands um, to calculate land surface temperature. So I'm using these, um, these, these functions that come in from this special library that was made for doing these kind of calculations. Um, that's one of the nice things about using these open source tools is that you can depend on other people to write some of the stuff. Um, and then I've written a little land surface temp calculation. Um, these are all very workupable things. Um, it just pulls in some constants, uses NDVI, and, um, and you're good to go. Um, so then this is just a, a little helper function to get the land surface temperature from a band. And then we need to know the metadata that goes along with the Landsat imagery. So that'll come in from, um, that'll come in from a, a matlab.txt file. So it has a kind of ugly read function. So this is another thing that I should probably dump into an intake spec. Um, and then we can read that in. Um, and then we'll get the Landsat surface temperature from each of these bands. Uh, I didn't quite set up my DAS graph the ideal way, so it's doing more work than it needs to, which it's warning me about. But uh, it, it did finish. Um, so now we have the land surface temperature for each of these bands. Um, and we can plot that. Um, so you see in that we, now we have land surface temperature. This is in Fahrenheit. Um, and we have these two different bands that are giving us different values for it. Um, and we can zoom in and they zoom together. And we can see what we've got. We've got this really hot area that we're probably going to look at a lot more. Um, so because I have two different values, I'll just take the mean of those. Um, X-ray makes it really easy to do calculations like this across different levels of your data. So since our data set um, has these two bands, we can just take the mean across band and we'll get that. And we can plot that and check out the, um, the land surface temperature. Um, so now we've plotted it. Um, we can still see that really hot patch that we were looking at before. Um, and I plotted it over a tiling service. So you can see the imagery below. That's from um, Esri, <laughs> the Esri imagery um, tiling service that they provide. Um, so we're starting to get somewhere. Um, so the next spot, the next thing to do is to try and it's kind of hard to see um, this kind of color map over the imagery. So the next thing I wanted to do was do some thresholding. So uh, I'm going to make a special color map that's just reds. Uh, you don't have to worry about this too much, but it's just a list that I've um, grabbed a piece of. Um, and then we're going to take uh, the only the area that's above 90 degrees, and we're going to plot that. Um, and so now we can see just those areas that are really, really hot. And we can look at those in more detail. Um, and that kind of allows us to see more what's going on, I think. Um, so we can see that there's these really hot patches over this black roof, for instance, um, which is to be expected. <laughs> um, so. The next thing that we're going to be looking at is adding in another layer of data, adding in the street tree data. And we're going to be looking at adding more interactivity to these plots. Um, so I'm going to save off that mean temperature data into a different data set so we can use it going forward. We won't have to redo all our work. Um, so I'm saving that into a, into a, um, into a czar. OK, so next notebook. Um, so now we're going to load in the, the tree data. Um, so it all comes from this. It's again GeoJSON and it takes a while to download because it's 100,000 lines of GeoJSON, um, which is not a very efficient data storage format, but it's well understood. Um, and we're going to use HVPlot again to render that data. Um, we're only going to render the first 10,000 because it's a little slow. Um, and then we'll, we'll make it faster and we'll render all of it. So in this case, I guess, yeah. Um, so this data, you can see if you zoom in, um, it takes a while to re-render. So it should, when it, you zoom in, it should re-render so that it aggregates to just um, a smaller size. Um, so you can see individual trees. Um, so that took a while. So I wanted to make it faster. So we can look at the data. We can see that each of these points, uh, each of these rows is just a point. 
and it doesn't really have any attributes of interest other than the geometry. So this is just a latlon, and we can extract that into a regular pandas data frame. So we'll do that, and then we can see that if we plot, now we're plotting all the points, not just the first 10,000. And you can see that it's a lot faster, it's a lot more responsive, um, and you can zoom in and out, and it just is nicer. So save that off. Uh, yep. Trees, uh, the trees are geolocated by somebody? Yep. I see. City did that. Um, they're street trees only. Yeah, that's a good note. They're not park trees. They're not personal trees. They're just street trees. Philly has a big program of distributing street trees, and they then tagged them all. <laughs> I think they got a bunch of interns. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll save that off into a more uh, optimized uh, file format for columnar data, which is Parquet. Uh, it's like a CSV, but better. Um, and then now we're going to... expand on that? I think that's an interesting... <laughs> I can't expand that much on it. But um, basically, it's, uh, it's for columnar data, but it's um, chunked. So you can read from it just the chunk that you need, um, and it makes it a lot faster. Um, yeah. That's my parquet spiel, I guess. Um, so there's kind of these uh, data file formats that we recommend for different, uh, s different uh, types of data. Parquet is the one that we recommend for 2D data. And uh, ZAR is the one that we recommend for n-dimensional data. So we're going to read in our data sets. Um, so for the interaction, we're going to be using panel, which is a new, um, a relatively new uh, package that we've been developing in the PyViz ecosystem. So this is our so this is our dashboarding solution. So it's for creating these interactive visualizations that have widgets that have different things that respond to different parts of the interaction. Um, it's based on Bokeh, um, and it's which is um, an interactive visualization library that creates the the link between Python and JavaScript and allows all this stuff to work. Okay, so we've read in our data. We're creating our little color map with the reds. And then we're going to try. So the first way that I tried to make this um, thresholding interactive was to use the um, panel.interact magic. Um, so here we've used a I've used a decorator to um, like widgetize the function. Um, so we have a function that takes an argument, which has a default value. And then we can set the range that we expect that default value to have and call panel.interact, and um, we'll get a slider that we can use to control that. So here's our just barely fits. Um, you can slide this threshold, and that'll re-render and change the, change the um, it's a little dark. So, um, But yeah, you can see that if you slide this, it'll re-render. Uh, one thing that's annoying about this approach is that it re-renders the whole graph, doesn't maintain your zoom, doesn't maintain anything. Um, another thing that's bad about it is that it recomputes the data, so it's not very efficient. Um, and also it requires the Python kernel to be running, so you can't do it statically. Um, so I was looking for a different approach, um, so we're going to use color clipping instead. Color clipping defines the ranges of the color bar rather than subsetting the data to only include the data that you need. So you keep the same plot, but you just change how you're rendering it. Um, so we're going to clip the colors so that uh, anything below our color bar is transparent and anything above our color bar is transparent. And then um, you'll see that looks kind of similar. Now we have no interaction, though. So then we need to add the interaction back in back in, and we can use JavaScript linking directly for that. Um, so I'm going to define a widget, which is a range slider that has a start and a, st a start value and an end value of the um, min and max temperature. Um, and then we'll link it to the color mapper um, low and high value. So there, I did have to write a little bit of JavaScript, but it wasn't too bad. Um, so that'll allow us to have this widget that can control the temperature without re-rendering the plot. Um, yeah, these guys are over here. Um, so you can see that it maintains your zoom, 
and it's also a lot faster and more responsive. So, and this will work in a static website because it doesn't require any um, Python kernel to be running because it's all just JavaScript at this point once it's rendered. Um, so now we're going to add in the layer of the tree data. So let's plot that. And then to, since it's a, um, a, a dashboard thing, it'd be nice to have maybe a tree, thing, a tree toggle to toggle the tree layer on and off. So we've got that. This is the same thing where we've set up um, a simpler JS link, um, which sets the value of the toggle to equal the, the visible of the renderer. So it can toggle on and off using just JavaScript. And then um, we'll set up a base map layer, which is the t from the tiling service. And we'll use, um, this, is, this, this is the last approach is a little more convoluted, I think. But um, it uses a hall of views to create a dynamic map, which accepts a stream from a widget. So the widget um, sets a value, and then this will update over here. So now that we've got all those different components, we can maybe add a couple more. Um, so these are alpha sliders um, to control the, how it all looks. Um, and then we can create a dashboard um, through this row and column uh, grid style thing uh, to combine all the different elements that we've um, defined above. So we then can render that. Um, and we've got our dashboard. So this is a, so this all just works. Um, anything that I, since I defined this above, it stays defined here. Um, so we can change it back to our original value. Um, you can still have our bokeh tooltips over here. So we can zoom in and it'll re-render the trees to be small again. Um, and we can also turn that layer on and off. Um, we can change the alpha so we can see really what's going on with that surface temperature. And we can change the alpha of the trees as well um, in case we want to see more clearly what's going on there. So the, the purpose of this whole work was to look at the relationship between the surface temperature and roof color. Um, there's a big campaign in Philly right now to get people to paint their roofs white because uh, it makes a huge difference. <laughs> Um, so you can really see that when you add this interactivity, you can really explore and see that, um, yeah, like the black roofs really does make a difference. Um, it really is super hot there. And then also there was this, um, people were interested in knowing whether um, street trees really made a difference in terms of the heat. Because the, there was a hypothesis that if there are more street trees, that there, it would be less hot overall. Um, and specifically right around the, where the trees are. Um, and that seems to be the case. It's a little hard, I think, to, to convince yourself that, um, that it's all about the trees because um, that, like, there's also just not trees on black roofs. So it's hard, a little hard to say like, which, is, which is going on more. But um, you need to like, actually do stats probably to get that. But, I thought it, um, just as a, as a little visual, here's this, this is a Navy yard, and you can see this area that has a lot of trees over here um, is like maybe hot, less hot than this area that has um, none. You can also see a little cloud cover there, which is probably messing things up. Um, so the last thing that I wanted, uh, well, there's a couple things, I guess, left. So you can also save this off into an HTML document, um, and most and it'll most of the things will just work because they're just JavaScript. Um, the only thing that won't work is the um, the switching between the different tile levels because that requires Python to be running. Um, the other thing you can do is um, people might have experienced IPy widgets before, which traps you in a notebook. Um, but uh, panel doesn't do that, um, and you can actually serve panel. Um, you can just do panel serve um, show. Um, I made a special notebook that just had uh, just the final product in it, but you don't need to do that. Um, so this is what the notebook that I'm serving here it looks like. Um, it just sets up all the little widgets and only renders the dashboard. 
just slightly faster to do it that way. It takes a little bit. See what my zoom is? Okay, should be good. And then I also, um, I popped this up. This is a static version that I just popped up at this link. Um, so this is just to show that this is just a static GitHub hosted thing. So this is just to show that the JavaScript linking really does work, even in a static version. You can play around with it. You can check it out. Um, and I just took off the layer that wouldn't work. So you'll notice that the only thing that doesn't really work right is that the trees don't uh, re-render on Zoom because that requires Python to be there. But you can toggle all the rest, play with it, see if this thing came up. OK, and this is the one with the live kernel behind it. Um, and you can see you can change the tiling service. Um, some of them are less helpful than other ones. Um, and you can zoom, and the trees will re-render. And yeah, so that's what I wanted to show you guys. Um, I guess the point is that you can do all this stuff in Python using open source tools. All these tools are out there. You can contribute to them. You can see what's going on. Um, and hopefully that's informative. Uh, there's a lot of different docs that I pulled up. Um, but basically, the things that I was showing you are intake, x-ray, um, and then pyviz is pretty much like the rest where you can find out about all sorts of different stuff. And it links to different projects that I explicitly used. That's, that's my spiel. Mm -hmm. uh, what's like the learning curve for something like this and are there tutorials online and, and classes or something? Okay. Um, you repeat the questions. Yes. Okay. So the question was uh, what's the learning curve and are there tutorials and how do I get started on this stuff? So I think I forgot to mention that this stuff is all uh, separate. Like these are all different things um, and you can start on any piece of them. So you can use just intake and carry on with your life, use matplotlib or whatever you're doing. Um, you can use just x-ray and not use intake. So they all, they create, um, used together, they create this workflow that I think is pretty nice. But um, they can also be used in isolation, which is more like a bite off of all thing. Um, there's a ton of tutorials on Pyvis. Um, there's also, there, just on this website, uh, there's links to yeah, there's tutorial. It'll probably take you a while to get through those. Um, there's also going to be new, there's new material that's coming out. Um, I think the panel docs are really nice in particular. Um, so there's a lot of different places to start. X-Ray has a lot of stuff that's completely isolated from the PyViz world. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different places. But you should be able to start with just one piece and build up from there, whichever piece is like most applicable to your stuff. Could you provide some maybe um, uh, experience or advice on if you were to, if you're doing this, maybe this is where you want to start out of the visualization tools? Out of the visualization yeah. tools? Out of the visualization tools, if you have data, I would start with HVPlot because that's, that's pretty much what I do. It uses the other things behind the scenes, but it allows you to do things that are really, really powerful, like, um, like plot 100,000 data points without a problem. Um, and that's because it uses everything else behind the scenes. So that, yeah, that should be a fairly straightforward learning curve. Yeah. Awesome. For so is HPplot, like if I use matplotlib, does HPplot have a similar interface or does it depend on like X-ray or, or you got to use some data structure with it? It has, so the question was um, whether HPplot has a similar interface to matplotlib. Um, it has the same API as the dot plot off a data frame. So that is matplotlib, but that might not be how you're using. If you're using like plot dot, like uh, if you're importing like matplotlib.py plot, um, then that's not the same interface. It's this other one that's, that's data first and then all the other arguments. Yeah. Yep. In the just HTML demo, how does it subset the data when you like zoom in the map or select things? Um, it, it doesn't re-render the data. Um, the tiling service is calling back to find the tiling. So that's, the base map is doing its own thing. We don't, 
not worried about that too much. But um, the, the trees are not re-rendering because they only have, it only has the data that has already been um, aggregated to the level of the original plot. Does that limit like how big a data set or notebook you could save in HTML? Um, no, but you aren't going to re, like you're never going to get this re-rendering. Um, like you it's just to going to get HTML infinitely big. Data. Yeah. Were you, were you pretty familiar with Landsat data, or is this something that like you just used and kind of used what they were using the previous project? Um, like, how did, did you have to learn much about Landsat? Okay, so the question is whether I have familiarity with the Landsat data. Um, I didn't originally. Uh, so a lot of the work that I do is for government contractors who are interested in how they can use um, our tools to do the work that they've been doing in ArcGIS or MapLab or something. Um, so they, they came to us with some workflows that were Landsat. And then this one I saw at a talk. Um, it's, the, the math is very straightforward. Um, so that's not really a hurdle. Right, I, guess I, I feel like when you look, look at Landsat, there's just so many options. It's a little overwhelming. I'm yeah. You had like some, some suggestions on how to like focus in on. Um, not really, I guess. I mean, I use Landsat 8, which has the right, it has like the right amount of data for me. Um, it has the two infrared bands. Um, the older ones I don't think have that, or they have only one band. Um, so you can read up on it. Uh, but it's all, all that, all the Landsat 8 data is also publicly available on Google Cloud Storage and S3. So it's a huge amount of data that's available. So you can also just poke around. Um, and I should have mentioned this, but it's stored as geo-optimized TIFFs, so um, you don't have to download it. You can you don't have to download it at all. You can just go look at it, get the metadata, and then get the chunk you want, and you never fetch the whole data set, which is really cool. They do start getting mad if you hit their URL too many times. <laughs> You'll get some 503s, but other than that, you're good. Anything else? So Landsat data, um, do you have to convert that from one EPS to, to the other, or do you have to play with the CRS systems in order to get it to render, or? Um, as long as you know what the CRS is. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. The question is around um, how you know what the CRS is for Landsat data and how you get that to project properly and, and work with the rest of your layers. Um, so I kind of sped through that part. but. Um, uh, yeah, so how it's stored in these geo-optimized TIFFs, the CRS is stored as, uh, the coordinate reference system is stored as an attribute. So we're reading it in using um, Rastereo and um, X-Array and Intake. And you'll see, uh, where is it? Yeah, so it's stored here as an attribute um, that comes along with the data. So Intake does a really good job of maintaining those attributes and maintaining the labels that your coordinates have and that your, all the rest of your data have. So that's one of the huge benefits that you get from using X-Array as opposed to using like straight NumPy arrays or something. Um, so then in this step here, I've taken that proj4 string and I've converted it. Well, actually, I just took this chunk of it. And I can use Cartapy, which is a, a mapping library out of the Met office. Um, and I've created a Cartapy um, CRS that I then use throughout to, to um, convey the projection info. And the Cartapy that, that should get rendered into the web pages, right? Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? So with that, uh, I would like to say that you know, as a part of doing data science, it's not only about number crunching, right? We've got to keep in mind that there's a huge amount of communication, and oftentimes that comes in the forms of data visualization, but also interactivity, and, and having data even be dynamic, adding a, a time layer to it, right? So I encourage everybody to extend their repertoire in terms of the tooling that they're using to go and explore these, these types of visualization tools. Yeah. So with that, let's thank Julia again for a great talk. <laughs>